Hey, this is Sayyam Botani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science, a podcast for data science enthusiasts where I interview practitioners, researchers and calculators about their journey, experience and talk all things about data science. Hello and welcome to another episode of CTDS Dot Show, the show containing quarantine content with chai and interesting kaggle stories. In this episode, I'm really honored to be talking to three amazing people from the other side of kaggle, three people from the kaggle team. Phil Kulitin, who's a kaggle data scientist, he's on the data science data science team at kaggle. Maggie Demkin, who's on the customer success. and business development team and Addison Howard who's a program manager as part of the team in this interview as you might imagine we talk a lot about what happens behind the scenes at Kaggle including a very interesting gladiator fight <laughs> please stay tuned if you'd like to know more about that we talk really about what happens from the start to the ending of the competition how does a competition really come to its life what happens before that what happens after that what happens during that while on the other side of the team the team also shares many amazing stories their favorite memories from hosting these competition their overview of kaggle and the community and hopefully many inside scoops that we as kagglers as the community don't get to witness as much so i'm really excited to be sharing this interview with you without further ado here's my interview with three people from the kaggle team Maggie Demkin, Addison Howard, and Phil Kulitin. Please enjoy the show. Hi everyone! I'm really honored to be interviewing a few Kagglers. This time from the other side of Kaggle, three amazing people from the Kaggle team. Maggie, Phil, and Addison. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. We're excited to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, I, I'm really confused about which all competitions I've competed in that <laughs> you all have hosted. But I'm really excited to be talking to and getting to know more about the other side of Kaggle. Um, I want to start by asking you, Kaggle, if I may, still a startup. Quote unquote. Uh, so there may be there could be many multiple answers to this, but uh, can you tell us what uh, tasks do you work on at Kaggle in your day to day? Yeah, I can go and, and start with this one. Um, you know, as I'm sure you've spoken about before, Kaggle was purchased about three years ago by Google. But one of the big values that we have is still maintaining that kind of startup culture. Um, specifically, we want to be, have a low ego internally, and we want to be very agile. We want to put our users first, and so being a part of Google that has two hundred thousand users, it can be difficult to do that sometimes.、Um, but we try to maintain that.、Uh, I would say agility is a big element of us maintaining that.、Um, <clears throat> excuse me.、Um, uh, ma- maintain that startup culture and trying to stay、uh, still hustle and stay hungry, sort of thing.、Um, uh, I know for me personally, and I'll hand it over to、uh, the other folks.、Um, uh, I'm one of the program managers on the Kaggle team. Um, so I specifically work on competitions and really trying to everything from start to finish of a competition that is not the data piece. So I I, I get to ride in the coattails of smart data scientists like Phil. For for,、oh. for just I'll, let, I'll go next. Just go to、ahead. let your audience know that was Addison for people that are tuning in through the audio. Please, Maggie,、cool. continue.、Um, Yeah, so my name is Maggie Demkin, and I am also a program manager.、Um, so, if、um, some of your listeners work at Google or are familiar with Google, program management is a pretty broad category at Google. But effectively, we do something like business. It's sort of business development slash customer success. If you wanted to ground kind of what the competitions program managers do.、Um, And、um, we work with companies, academic organizations, or really anyone who's interested in、um, hosting a competition. So、um, we talk to them from their initial idea all the way through to the whole life cycle of the competition. 
Um, we get to sit in on the winner's calls, which is um, really fun. Um, but, but yeah, the program managers, we are just really kind of watching the whole life cycle of the competition and making sure that everything's kind of running smoothly. Um, and we partner with people like Phil. So maybe he can go next. Sure. Uh, yeah, so I'm a competitions data scientist, a Kaggle data scientist at Google. Um, our job, the data scientist job, is essentially taking the data that a host wants to bring to Kaggle and making sure that they've got uh, a functional machine learning problem to work on. Um, so we do a lot of uh, we do a lot of data analysis. We do a lot of um, you know EDA. We do a lot of ML um, when we get the chance to to try and figure out whether or not um, it's a workable problem. Um, we do a lot of data cleaning. Uh, we have to make sure that like we take this data set in. So normally as an ML researcher or an ML engineer, you have um, you have data responsibilities, right? Like when you take a data set, you need to make sure you're, it's not leaking. You need to make sure that you're using it correctly. You need to make sure it's being cleaned correctly. And for us, we need to do that before it goes out into the world. So we do this kind of preventive data maintenance um, before it goes out to the community to hopefully try and eliminate the possibility of things like leakage and other issues that might pop up that you would normally just kind of deal with as a researcher or an engineer. Awesome. We will dive more into life cycle of a competition very soon. But first, I want to ask Maggie, you were already at Google. I think your previous, correct me if I'm wrong, your previous startup was acquired by Google. You were already working there. And after Google acquired Kaggle, I think, then you switched to working on the Kaggle team. Why, why did you make that decision? Yeah, so um, I um, I worked at a startup that, um, it was a satellite startup. So we, the team that I was a part of literally built satellites from scratch. And we would launch them into space and see them, you know, and, and the, the satellites would take pictures of the Earth. And so I had a customer success role there and I got to talk about really cool stuff and work with, um, you know, really smart people. And, uh, and it was a very small team. So we all worked very, it was a very tight knit group. And um, so um, when I was looking for that next team, I wanted to find something like that. Um, and there were lots of different, you know, Google can be a very, very big company and you can yeah. find a, a different spot here and there. But um, actually this recruiter showed my background to the Kaggle team. And within like a few days, I met with so many people on Kaggle. So Wendy Kahn, um, who's still around, um, Megan, who runs data sets now, Julia, Elliot, who's on the program management team. And then I had a breakfast meeting with Anthony because um, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I could go in and meet him. And of course, you know, you look at his background and he was he's so smart and so amazing. Um, so I had coffee with him. And More time. by <laughs> what? No, yeah, I think he was having tea, actually. So oh, that's, that's good. Um, yeah, so we, we met for breakfast. And then later that day, he was like, I want you to join the team. And I'm like, I can't think of a better team. So it was a really great um, great introduction. And it, it, the team has all those elements, like really smart people, really interesting problems to solve. And um, so, yeah, I just transferred right over and it was really fun for me. I feel like I found a, a great team uh, that awesome. way. Yeah. Uh, Anthony had already mentioned this, but I want to highlight again for the users, the Kaggle team is much smaller compared to the number of users. And to the best of my knowledge, the team is completely remote. So just want to ask you all how things you have learned while uh, working remotely with each other as, as advices to people who are just starting to work remotely now, unfortunately, due to, due to the pandemic. Yeah, Addison, you um, want to go first? Yeah, probably Phil and I can, can speak to this well. Um, as, as you mentioned, the Kaggle team is about 60-ish about folks relative to our nearly 5 million users now. Um, as a fun aside, uh, some Kagglers know about this, but a little bit of an inside scoop is 
we have our own internal Kaggle competition to try to predict when we're going to hit 5 million users. <laughs> um, so I don't know, I don't know if I'm going to win or not, but <laughs> uh, trying to see when our 5 millionth user is going to, is going to activate. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. But as you mentioned, right, we do have a very small team relative to, to the size of, um, of our community and even to the size of, of Google broader. Um, many of the individuals in the Kaggle team do work closely to a Google office. Um, and so they, uh, they often spend a lot of their time. I know Maggie, uh, is, is probably spends floats around about four or five different offices since they're all in the Bay area. Uh, but Phil and I both work primarily from our, from our houses. Um, uh, it's, it's something that before Kaggle was acquired had been a big value because the team was very remote. Um, not, not that we don't find a lot of value in face to face time. That's not, that's not true at all. We, we definitely do. And we have chances to meet up together, uh, multiple times per year face to face. But I know personally what I find is um, it helps me it helps me maintain a better balance a better work life balance um, in the sense that you know this like last night I had a phone call with some folks in Southeast Asia um, at ten o'clock at night and I had a phone call this morning at seven a.m. and then I took a break this morning and then I'm back at work again so it allows some flexibility that you may not have if it's always just on just off while you're in the office. Um, and it and it sort of creates a, a stronger sense of trust among your among your colleagues, uh, somewhat because you kind of have to. You don't have that face to face time. You have to have a stronger trust with people who you aren't seeing every single day. Um, but when it creates and has a very healthy culture, it allows you to get a lot more done. And there's there's no questioning. Oh, are they getting their work done? Oh, uh, Addison has to go to a dentist appointment. Uh, don't worry, he's going to get his work done. It's not a big deal. So I found it to be very helpful because it, it the flexibility is really valuable to maintain um, good mental health and just good overall balance, as well as the trust you have with your community with your colleagues is pretty unrivaled in a remote culture. I, I think that also gets reflected in the competing teams. Although it's it's not the same thing, but. Uh most of the competitors work in remote teams many of them i remember the zillow story they hadn't even met each other the team that won the prize and they first met after winning the huge prize i'm sorry yeah. Phil, do you have to do you have anything to add oh yeah um so i've been working remotely since 2009 actually and i think kaggle does it really well um i think that one of the major uh things that Addison brought up, but trust, uh, we really work hard to maintain that. Like we're, we're very candid with each other. We don't, you don't hide things from each other. We bring issues up and solve them. I think that's, you know, working at previous, uh, remote jobs that, you know, were great jobs. Um, but they didn't necessarily, um, they didn't all necessarily push for that. Um, I, I think that that's really one of our, our best aspects, frankly. That's what makes us work so well uh, remotely, um, is that we can trust each other to do the right thing and, and to bring things up if there are issues. Um, plus, we have a very strong internal culture around making sure that our audio video setup is very good, or at least workable, so that, <laughs> so that our meetings always go smoothly, hopefully. Or, or else, or else, everyone knows what the expectation was, um, and and the expectation should be met. So I, I think that's we've got like those two major aspects. I feel like are are great parts of. Uh, I'm not going to do it. That Anthony tells this. Anthony tells a joke that Addison will tell in a second um, because no. Addison tells it better than I do. Yeah. No. You to you can follow up what I'm saying with Anthony's AI AI joke, because um, you you tell it better. Um, so, right. So you know, at previous jobs, you know, I you know, tons of emails, tons of like back and forth. But I, I feel like here, like, it's they've they found the right mix for making mm -hmm. this work. Uh, just to okay, let the Addison. audience know, sorry, uh, I read somewhere that Phil has been uh, involved in machine learning since the beginning of time, even before uh, carnivore <laughs> whales had come out. <laughs> <laughs> that's oh, you that's really good research. Yes, I have since <laughs> since before since the dinosaurs roamed the earth and and 
I'm built linear models out of rocks. Yeah, that that was me. That was me back then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Phil predicted the asteroid that killed the dinosaur. They just <laughs> they should listen. They That's the why I'm still there. here. I got in the cave. <laughs> I just hung out. It was great. Um, yeah. No. I, thank you, though. Yes, it's it's been a long time. This is really like one of the best teams I've been on, honestly. And I think like Maggie brought up, you know, this is a great bunch of people. Um, I really feel like I'm friends with everybody here on the competitions team. Um, you know, we don't always agree, but we always work it out. It's a pretty great team. Now, Addison should tell the the AI joke. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised if Anthony already mentioned it on the on his podcast interview. Uh, but he said Almost we may certainly. be, yeah, we may be solving AI, but we still haven't solved AV. And and it's gotten to the point where it's you know all of us the team just we just shake our head and yeah we just wait for uh, uh, we we can wait for the groans to die out but anytime there's a an audio problem or a visual problem or some kind of tech problem we just kind of look to Anthony see him getting a little bit giddy ready to to tell the <laughs> joke and anyway it's fun this yeah. is definitely the best uh, guest audio that I have had on the podcast. <laughs> Um, you know, I'd like to bring up the working remotely just because I do, I, I work um, really close between San Francisco and Mountain View um, in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I can go to the office whenever I want. But, um, you know, I would go to the office and no one would be there. So I was like, wait, because everyone just can very easily work from home. We, you know, internally, we have our own Slack channels. And so we have a lot of really cool Slack channels around cooking and, um, you know, like I learned that Meg really likes to sous vide recently. And so, I mean, we can really connect even though we don't live in the same place so that I working from home is really seamless. And I think that for people who are working from home for the first time, um, and I realized this last night when I was on a call, you get to, you get a view into people's homes. So it makes it almost more personal to interact from home. I was on a call last night with um, a, an executive, and I'm pretty sure he was taking the call from his daughter's bedroom. You know, so I was like, <laughs> "Wow, that's great!" You know, I think this is kind of a unique time that we can really see people. You know, and Walter, I, you know, I, it's like whenever I get on a call with Walter, I just I'm waiting to see like what kind of t-shirt he's going to wear because he always has funny things. On. So you, you can really kind of see a more personal side to people when they're working from home and there's a comfort level. I hope that some of those elements don't go away, you know, when we all go back to offices, you know. Certainly. So now, now I want to switch back uh, to other side of Kaggle, um, the th things that happen are on the other side of Kaggle. You mentioned a bunch of things. Uh, if you were to pick one of the favorites, favorite tasks out of everything that you're working on, what would that be? Um, you know, okay, so there's, I think there's probably, I, I talked about how we, we get to, you know, Addison and I, and really the whole data science team as well, like we get to see the whole life cycle of a competition from that initial meeting where you meet a, ho a potential host and you're like, I hope they have enough data and I hope their <laughs> problem is structured enough, right? So there's a lot of anticipation, but probably my favorite part is the winner's call mm. because people have won, the hosts are excited, we all get together, we record the call, and then um, there's this like sharing of ideas and um, it's, it's really, that's probably my favorite part is just participating in the winner's calls and seeing that like, wow, you have an amazing background or I didn't expect that or you know, just all those interesting things that come out of winner's calls. Do you still get blown away by the winning solutions? Yeah. I mean, just because they're, they're so creative and oftentimes, you know, a lot of the hosts think they have the answers and they're like, wow, that's something I wasn't expecting, you know? So th that's really fun. Addison, do you, do you want to chime in? Yeah, I was, I was going to say just a follow-up to Maggie said, we've had plenty of hosts say things like, in, you know, I've been working at this company for 20 years and the Kaggle community knows more about our processes in the first 24 hours just by looking at the data. 
Um, I, I would say while well, Maggie's highlighting sort of the end of the competition for me is probably the very, very beginning. Um, so uh, as you may know, a lot of people want to want to host a competition on Kaggle. They come to the website, they can fill out a form that, that outlines their problem. We get hundreds, hundreds of these per year. Um, and most of them go through, go through me first. And then we as a team, myself, Maggie, and our other uh, program managers will uh, take a look at them and, and, and with the data scientists from if it's going to work or not. What I love about it is, is everything, everything comes across the, comes across our desk, comes across our email in the widest variety of industries saying, we think machine learning can be used to address this. Mm-hmm. And so I just find it super fascinating to see how machine learning is being applied to such a variety of, of, of industries and problems. Now, obviously we don't host hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of competitions per year. Um, and a lot of them don't end up making it to the, uh, to be a, a stamp of approval kind of competition, but it's just really cool to see the variety of industries that, and just just problem statements that are coming across saying, here's what we're trying to solve. We really think that machine learning can take us that next level. So I, I just find it, I consider myself a very curious person. And so I find a lot of excitement out of just seeing what other people are trying to solve. And at, at the time of recording, just a simulation competition has launched on Kaggle recently. Um, that's, that's again, a different category of competition. C- correct. Yeah. And that's something that actually Phil and I were very closely involved with. Um, we can, we can talk about that a lot later too, but um, that's a whole new offering for us is, is no longer a traditional supervised machine learning competition. Then we had analytics competitions and a wide variety of, of, uh, of, of variations, but realized that reinforcement learning is, is still as hot as it's ever been. And so um, we've had a great relationship with Two Sigma. Um, we run a, com- a couple of uh, traditional kind of competitions with them. Halite was a competition that they had run for a long period of time. And they said, hey, we love this. We love working with you. How would you feel about, uh, about handling this? They said, great, we would love to. And we're excited to see that grow as well. Another one was, uh, I think, the Arc Challenge hosted by Francois Chole, uh, which was again, different from the traditional RTL. Yeah, yeah. Can, can you imagine? Um, that's one that I believe Walter and Maggie, I'm not sure if you were over this one or if it no, might have been. Julia. It was Julia. Um, I, it, it, that's the type of competition that still kind of blows my mind. Like I still don't fully comprehend exactly what was happening. But Walter was describing to me, you know, hey, it's been three months and the best model has solved one problem. <laughs> like, oh, okay, this is this is very clearly a difficult challenge. Um, but then having folks like Francois Chalet um, and, um, and a, a number of really industry leaders come to Kaggle saying, we have a great problem or we have a great technology or we have a, we want to test out this new library. We think Kaggle is a place to do it. Um, you know, that's why you see us promoting things like TPUs and other technologies that, that people are saying, hey, this might be the next wave of, uh, of uh, the, the, ne- the next Keras, the next TensorFlow, the next uh, XGBoost, whatever it may be. We've been, we've very fortunately just ridden the coattails of all the successes that have come from the Kaggle community, where they brought something to us. It's, it's, it's expanded tremendously. The community has adopted it. And now we've seen that happen over and over again. And we get to see what that is in our community uh, and see it happen right in front of our very eyes. So uh, having folks like Francois Chalet is somewhat of a, um, just it's kind of reinforces the, the strength of the Kaggle community and, and really what uh, they can do to disseminate the, the best and greatest technologies as fast as possible. Starting from XGBoost, and now it's it's not that much. Although some frameworks do get tested on Kaggle, it's it's really a test of research. If if a research paper is practical, you'll find it in the top solutions or in a Kaggle kernel, most probably in in just a few days. Yeah, it's something that we mention often when we're looking at competitions is um, is uh, we kind of joke to uh, to competition hosts when they may say, "Hey, we got a great competition idea. What do you think?" We try to tell them. Uh, we think that there's a chance that there could be some leaky data in this or, or something like that. And they say, oh, no, it's fine. We're sure no one's going to figure it out. And we immediately tell them, no, the Kaggle community continually outsmarts everybody at every single turn. Uh, and, and so what we liken it to is we say, hey, us as, the, us as Kagglers and data scientists like Phil and other folks on our team may spend dozens of hours uh, overviewing a problem to see if it's a good fit. 
but now give it to the Kaggle community and you're going to have thousands of people spending hundreds of hours each, it has to be resilient. And so similar mm -hmm. to technologies, whatever is being brought forward has to be able to withstand the investigation and curiosity and examination and research of the Kaggle community in order to effectively be the best technology out there. I think Anthony had mentioned this and this also a unique uh, thing that your works, your work or works really get scrutinized by thousands or even sometimes millions of uh, people on Kaggle. Uh, sorry, Phil, uh, what would be your uh, favorite task? If you were to pick one, out oh of everything you want to do. Uh, well, not getting my work scrutinized by millions of people on Kaggle. Um, that would not be my favorite part of the job. Um, it's it's so different. You know, I come from a, a very long ML engineering and research background. And at most, you know, maybe, maybe a thousand users will take a hard look at what you've done. But on Kaggle, it's, it's everybody. And they're yeah. all smarter than you. It's amazing. Um, it's terrifying sometimes to launch a competition knowing that all of these amazing brains are going to be digging into what you've just done. So no, my favorite part of working on Kaggle competitions is working with the team, honestly. Um, I mean, that's why I came to Kaggle. Um, I, when I get up in the morning on Monday, even if I know it's gonna be a tough Monday, I am looking forward to working with Maggie and Julia and Addison um, my other fellow data scientists. Um, we've just got to really, everybody's so passionate and everybody brings something different to the table. Um, that's what I look forward to the most in every project is is the team I'm going to be working with. Just to remind the audience, for, for a small team, that's very easy. And working on such uh, competitions, it's it's really passion that, that must be driving them to empower a huge community. Totally. Yes. Uh, it is. Yes. Something, something strong and powerful and, and almost otherworldly must be driving us. Um, because it's very hard. It's a hard job sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I, I'd say my favorite piece of working with everybody except for Phil. Everybody on the team <laughs> except for Phil is. I was going to leave Addison out. I really was, but I included you in the list. <laughs> Just so nobody <laughs> finds out. <laughs> okay, so uh, can, can you walk us through the process of setting up a competition? What, what does the pipeline look like for you? Some people, like you said, approach you through through the form. What, what happens after that? And uh, not many people realize this. You are the people who convert the business problem into a competition. Can you also give us an inside scoop of that? Sure. Let's, uh, we, can, we can tag team this one. I'll, I'll kind of start it off from... Um, where it starts and, um, and, and as I mentioned before a lot of the, the inbound um, uh, competitions come my direction Maggie also usually gets a lot of the um, uh, references from internal groups at Google as well as some of the really the biggest logos you'll ever see on Kaggle the biggest companies are the ones that will go towards Maggie uh, those don't always come directly through our traditional channel um, but as I mentioned we'll ask a handful of, of introductory questions what are you trying to solve what data set do you have um, and, and I call myself sort of the first line of defense. So um, I'll take a look at what, the, what they've submitted. And, uh, and I used to try to get an idea of is it going to be good or not. And I try to ask some questions via email, set up a phone call with, with the prospective host. And because I don't have the technical um, background that, that our data scientists do, I try to ask every question I can without actually looking at the data yet. So I'm asking, okay, what are you trying to solve for? What data do you have? How much data do you have? Is it public anywhere? What are the variables? Um, and and I, tell, I tell a lot of hosts, there are plenty of great machine learning problems that don't make for good machine learning competitions. Mm. And there are plenty of great machine learning competitions that don't make for good Kaggle competitions. And so our, our process, at least for me, is to kind of narrow it down to that. Once it's gotten to the point where I feel comfortable enough with it, even though somebody else you know, haven't re reviewed the data yet, then we'll hand it off to someone like, like Phil or data scientist to kind of review a little bit more. Yeah, and so we do a lot of the, um, the upfront asking questions and and homework and um, and then we tee it up so we get the host to deliver data to us and we tee it up for the data scientists and then it's a little bit of like 
we think this is a good problem. Do you agree? Right. And then, you know, um, people, you know, the data scientists will review it and they'll run tests and they'll look at the problem and see if it's feasible and they'll, um, you know, give us a thumbs up or thumbs down. And um, that it's a good day when they're like, yes, this is going to be a great problem. Because then, then um, Addison and I will jump back in with the host and we'll get, you know, all the other things in place. Um, so there's marketing piece, the description, the logos, the, the banner image. We spend a lot of time um, on the banner image just to say like, oh, is this working? Or what does that look like? <laughs> um, you know, we have discussions about prize money, right? So I'm having a conversation now with um, a host that's like, how much is the right amount of prize money to offer, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it's like this balancing act of like, is it a complex problem that would merit a lot of prize money or is it simple? Or do you want to be known as, you know, someone that offers a lot of, like, it, it's a conversation that we end up having. Obviously, we're always like more prize money, more prize money. But, yeah. um, but you know, mm -hmm. we, we talk through all the different pieces of the competition and then just, you know, work towards that launch date, which we, I mean, I think that's another one of my favorite times is when we finally launch. Phil says he's really scared, but I'm always like, yes, we got it. We, people get to see it now. Um, but yeah. But would you, would you add anything to that, Phil? I, yeah, totally. Um, so, right, once the, the, the program managers do this, like, incredible amount of work just to get the data to us, and, and in theory, the business problem, right? Like, so if a company or, or a researcher or whoever is running a competition comes to us, they'll say, I've got this data. I think it solves this. And our job pretty quickly is to look at it and say, yeah, okay, that actually, like, it's possible to solve that problem with this, or that's a reasonable problem. Like, we have to we look at a bunch of aspects of it. Um, often, though, sometimes that problem isn't a great fit for their data, and so we'll suggest alternative business problems that they could come at, or, or you know, ways of changing the data or the problem that will make it workable on Kaggle. We, we essentially try and fit it into what we can do. Um, you know, one thing I ask the, the program managers We've already, you know, we think it's interesting. They think it's interesting. You know, we want to try and make it work. So we try and find ways to make it work. Um, and then after, once that's done, then usually it gets handed off to sort of the, its final data scientist, um, often the same person. Um, and then it's our job to clean it, ferret out all the leakage, remove any issues, uh, find samples that aren't going to work, um, you know, format everything for the, the competition, um, which depending on the size of the data and the type of the data can be a huge undertaking. Like that can take a week or two of, of cleaning and engineering to figure out how you're going to get 4 million images into whatever format you need them in on Kaggle. Um, so yeah, it, it goes from this kind of like uh, very sort of data analyst thing, business problem analyst to machine just almost machine learning engineer data science engineer to then you know getting it all on kaggle and figuring out how to tell people about it um, and the, the program managers and data scientists usually work together on that like how are we going to describe this how do we say what this data is how do you like describe what the evaluation metric is right and that's hard it's easy to get that wrong so we work pretty hard to to find the best way to say it um, we also work really hard with the host. So the people who come to us, with, you know, they've obviously got a stake in it too. So there's a lot of back and forth, a lot of meetings, a lot of, um, you know, I've spent months working with hosts on their evaluation metrics to make sure that it, it'll work on our side because our evaluation metrics run potentially millions or tens of millions of times a day. So they have to be written yeah. in very like, optimized C sharp code as opposed to Python or something. Um, so we, there's a lot of sort of interim work that has to happen between us saying, here's the business problem this can solve. And then it actually getting launched. It's a pretty, it's a pretty epic job. It's kind of awesome in, in a sort of, you know, million hot dogs in space kind of way. Um, 
where, wow, it's a million hot dogs and it's in space. It's that kind of awesome where you're just kind of breathless for a while. Um, I think that's part of why it's terrifying is it's this huge task potentially um, that, that you know that you've only had your whatever hundreds of hours to spend on it or dozens of hours. Um, there's, there's definitely a fear factor for me, at least when we're saying, great, Hey, rest of the world. Now see what you can do with this. <laughs> I've I'll never do heard of a million hot dogs in space. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you think about it. It's now, like, now oh, a million intrigued. hot dogs in space. There you go. <laughs> I think that's an old Eddie Izzard gag, actually, about the, the improper use of the word awesome. Um, so just to properly give credit there. Oh, uh, you had a question, though? Yeah. How, how, how do you decide uh, which person from the current team will be working with the organizing team? Do you draw the shortest straw or is there a rock paper <laughs> uh, Maggie and Addison can probably speak to this as well. Um, for me, I usually take things that we usually take things that we're interested in. Sometimes there are tasks that are just seem like they're going to be really hard. And that's essentially like whoever has the bandwidth to deal with it will take it. But very often, you know, I love uh, NLP. I come from an NLP background, so I love to grab the NLP problems and try and do well with them. Um, so it's it's a mix. It's a mix of like who's who's got the interest and who's got the time, I guess. But but there's probably actually more of a process to it. So maybe Addison and Maggie have more to say about that. I think it, I mean ultimately it ends up coming down to um, just bandwidth, right? So we have a lot of ideas, and then we have to figure out like, oh, Phil's really packed. At this moment, he's doing a lot of stuff. So then, let's give the next one to Walter. And I mean, um, the good news is we everyone is just really fun to work with. Um, so it doesn't really, you know, from us, it's just a matter of like uh, making sure that people aren't too busy and spreading the work out. Okay. So I think that's. I thought you were going to talk about how we have the the weekly gladiator contest where there's a. A fight for every competition, but, but oh, we, I forgot about we, we that part. Yeah, yeah, we can cut that out of the podcast. That's we don't need to talk about that. <laughs> There's definitely a weekly unmuting contest where it's like, who's going to unmute unwisely first when someone asks, <laughs> "Do you want this competition?" <laughs> uh, I, I will say a little bit more of the inside scoop to the review process is once any of us program managers feel like a competition is ready for a data review. We often kind of stagger that into two separate stages. So we may say, hey, can you give this a preliminary review? So directionally, is this going to work? Um, and, and usually data scientists may throw a, um, a baseline model at it. And, and, and again, making sure that there's not leakage, there's not one feature that gives away 99% of the signal and make sure there is still some signal to be had. That doesn't guarantee that that person is going to also be the lead data scientist on it. Uh, but like Phil said, we, we, we try to we try to make sure people can get the competitions that they they like the most. I know we just launched one uh, as of the time of this recording. We launched the bird call, bird song yeah. competition uh, a few days earlier. Um, that's with our colleague Sawyer. And Sawyer comes from a family who loves bird watching and recognizing bird sounds. Who said, I'd love to take this one. I think it's it'll be a great uh, a great one to tell my family about. Um, so yeah, it's it's a it, it's not as formal as you may expect. Okay. Um, you mentioned a bunch of testing obviously would go on in the background. Uh, what, what sort of testing and uh, goes out goes on once you decide you're going to host a competition? And it, it sometimes takes a month, a few months. I remember in a panel, Anthony had mentioned the Zito competition took a few months to finally launch on Kaggle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, Maggie and Addison, I'm sure, have their own stories. Um, it, it depends on the type of competition um, and the size of the competition and whether or not we're doing a custom evaluation metric because um, mm -hmm. that that certainly can add an enormous amount of time attempting to align that highly optimized, the highly parallelized like C-sharp code with whatever reference code the host might have is like an incredible... I was an ML engineer for like forever, right? it's hard to do this. I was doing this stuff before. It's hard to do it, especially like often. You do it all the time. It's like, it doesn't get easier. It just gets harder. Um, but so 
we do it so for say uh, an image competition um you know we'll do the the obvious stuff which is you know make sure there's there's probably like uh 15 or 20 major leakage vectors between train and test in an image competition so we try and run those down um, and make sure that there's none of that and we shift the data set around if there you know is potential for it um we i think we've mentioned a couple times previously that we we potentially build models um, to see whether or not there's signal. Um, that, you know, that can be really tough to do for, you know, like if you've got a big segmentation or object detection problem, that can be a, a hard task to pull off that we don't necessarily have time to do. So we may not build a model for a competition like that. Um, so, right, lots and lots of leakage chasing lots of staring at images and tabular data and just thinking through all the possible ways that you, if you were a Kaggle competitor, how would you break this? Mm -hmm. um, and, and trying very hard to combat that, that inner Kaggler that you have um, and make sure that you, you know, there, you eliminate as many of those, of those avenues as possible. But I know that uh, I think Maggie actually worked on Zillow, so you might have some insight into into how many how those months were spent. <laughs> um, setting up the competition, so just like time frame or like is that the question? I think oh. with the data testing, who was the data scientist on uh, Zillow? Wendy, Wendy Khan. Oh, Wendy. Okay. Yeah, I know. Um, and uh, she's still friends with the, the host. It's really awesome. But yeah, no, uh, our competitions take a real, sometimes they take a really long time to launch. And sometimes we work with hosts for a year because, you know, as Phil described, sometimes they'll send us their initial data and we're like, whoa, no, this isn't going to work. And they might have <laughs> to collect a whole new data set, which takes time. They might have to, you know, revamp everything. So, so you know, Sometimes we'll talk to them in September and then they'll get us the data the following May and then we launch the, you know, it's a very fluid process and there's no like, we, you know, we launch in a certain amount of time. Like there's a lot of variables that we're constantly chasing and managing. Um, so it's, it's hard to say. How, how hard is, is it for you to not uh, leak or tease it to the community? Because I know you all are, of course, active in a lot of Kaggle communities and we all are always tagging you, hey, at Addison, this is broken. Can you please look into this? How, how hard is it? Because I know inversion tends to tease a few competitions here and there sometimes. Yeah. Oh, you mean like mentioning future possible competitions? Yes, because most of the times we're like, hey, Addison, we're waiting for another competition. When will it come out? Whereas behind the scenes, you almost might be ready for it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is yeah, it's kind of hard to, to keep quiet. <laughs> Um, cause it, we even have a policy. There's plenty of hosts who say, Hey, can we announce the competition is, is starting in three weeks? And we say, no, we can't do that. Uh, because you know, a, a lot of the review that data scientists like Phil are putting into the competition can sometimes go up to the last minute. There's been a mm -hmm. few competitions that we were ready to launch. And then an hour before we were about to, to push it out the door and make it go live. We had to pull it and wait a few more weeks or months okay. because we found an issue. So we're, we're very um, cautious to ever announce a competition that is starting uh, before it's actually on the platform live, um, which is why we always see posts saying, hey, when's another one coming out? And we always just kind of have this smirk in the background saying, stay tuned, you know, <laughs> it's, it's coming soon. Um, just because, you know, we're, we're usually working on dozens of competitions at a time in the background. Um, on a regular basis that we just can't talk about until they actually go live. Right. It's it's 18th of June today at the time of recording. Is, is another competition coming up? I have to ask. <laughs> we can neither confirm nor deny any future competitions that may or may not be released in any point in the near future today, past or present. Yeah. Okay. So do, do you have any favorite uh, memory as a competition host? I know I've seen all three of your names with the red, I think the, the organizers name turn red when, when they're part of the organizing team on the forums. So I get to work on the data science bowl. Um, so that's really fun because the Booz Allen team is just, they take it so seriously and they are great hosts to work with. 
um, you know, we, we work collaboratively to vet ideas for the data science goal. And so it's really, when, when you're working that close and you've worked together for you know, many years, it's really, it's really fun to have that, um, have that kind of relationship. And when they take it really seriously and, and the community likes those competitions and things like that, like I think those things really work really well. So I, yeah, I would say Data Science Bowl is probably like my favorite just because every, every year they're trying to take it to another level and it's just fun to participate in that with them. Um, Phil, what would be your best memory and also your best memory as a competitor? I know you predicted the asteroid uh, that, <laughs> that led to the extinction of dinosaurs, your favorite memory on, of competing on Kaggle and as a host. Gosh. Um, as a host, uh, I ran a competition, I think Julia and I ran a competition, um, called human, the human protein Atlas, um, which was this really fascinating image competition. Um, and I think maybe like six or eight months later, forever later after the competition ended and it went really well, um, the hosts and all of the people who'd done well in the competition were all published in Nature, mm. uh, Nature Methods. I, I was incredibly proud of of the host. That host was awesome. Uh, I was proud of all the competitors. Uh, I was proud that we'd done a good enough job that it would have like qualified for that. That was probably my favorite moment as a as a competition host um, was was seeing all of our competitors and our host get this amazing kind of accolade out in the world. That was really neat. Um, as a competitor, uh, I don't know, my, my time as a, com I, I was a competitor before there were such a thing as grandmasters. Okay. So when I became a master, uh, I think I became a master after like a, f a couple, it wasn't, it was like a minimal number of competitions. I got really lucky and, and had some great teammates. Um, I was really happy about that, but my big, that my favorite memory of that was working with um, Mario's, uh, Casanova, uh, Hank, Triskelion. I mean, I, they were my teammates in my early Kaggle competitions. Like after my first Kaggle competition, I worked with Mario's and Triskelion for like several competitions. And it was, it was as beautiful as you might imagine it would be. You know, Triskelion always had awesome cool ideas. Mario's always brought this like great engineering mindset to the table. Um, I was basically like the tag along guy in like a super group of machine learning people like machine learning scientists. It was amazing. So that is, that's probably my favorite memory as a competitor is working with that, that little group. It was really great. And arguing with Walter inversion um, <laughs> in the forums. He claims not to remember me, but I distinctly remember arguing with him. And that was also really fun. So that's probably like, that's on the list somewhere. <laughs> now I think that continues. Too. Now I, it must continue in the internet Slack. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, no, no, no. Walter and I get along all the time. Actually, I, we get along really well, but uh, our relationship is very... Um, <laughs> is uh jabby jabby let's call it uh we like to we like to poke fun at each other it's really fun it, Sorry, he's, I like, you, he's one of the reasons that i came honestly oh what was that uh, i interrupted my game sorry <laughs> okay. oh no i didn't okay uh, i, just I think the your... entire competition team likes to to poke fun at each other probably to the point where the remainder of kaggle is concerned about our own well-being <laughs> because of how much we make fun of each other and poke jabs and uh, give each other oh. a hard time, but we love each other so much. Like Walter came and Walter came and, like hung out with me in my city for a week. We just like hung out, and he he went he went trick or treating with my kids. Like we all yeah. we all love each other. It's awesome. And they ate all the donuts in his whole town. Like there were no donuts. Ate, left. Like <laughs> Walter <laughs> bought so many donuts. He, it was just the two of us in this little office that I'd rented for us to hang out in. And he brought like two dozen donuts. And I was like, who are they for? And he was like, for us. And I was like, yes. For all breakfast. right. I like you. And then we'll yeah, get more for breakfast. lunch. Well, we, then we went to the taco place for lunch. That was, and then more donuts for dinner. It was great. So yeah, no, we, we all get along super well. Yeah. 
is is Walter the uh, pretty on the team? Uh, because I remember he mentioned uh, all of the competitions, and uh, unofficially are sponsored by Monster Energy. At least the one that he launches. <laughs> We're all kind of foodies. Um, at, you know, as mentioned earlier, we we have a couple of different um, meetings per year where we go from being remote to all being together, um, and we 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 maintain that since since being acquired by Google. And we have little chances for the competition team to do things on our own, and they almost always involve food. Um, so we um, we usually find good donuts or good ice cream or good food locations to hang out. So we, uh, I, I would yeah, say, um, there's what what is there? It's the it's the it's the internet term for like the longer an argument happens on the internet, the more quickly something will be compared to Hitler. Well, in the competition team, the version of that is the longer that the discussion happens on the competition team, the quicker it's going to result in donuts. That's, <laughs> donuts. How, that's kind of how things back. work for us. So. Yeah. Um, Addison, your your favorite memory as a competition host, if if you were to pick any. Yeah, I probably have a couple. Um, I would say two of the. Um, I mean, any time that we have a host that we hear back from after competition is concluded, uh, that talks about the great success that their algorithm or the mo- the winning models or winning solutions or techniques have had, is always really exciting for me. Um, I know in particular we were working with a group at Happy Whale that has been doing a lot of uh, whale recognition. Um, you know, as you imagine, you're out in a boat in the middle of the ocean, and you're literally just trying to find a picture of a whale coming up over the water for three seconds. And so having a, a model that can say, oh, hey, that's that's Joe the whale, that's Frank the whale, um, can be really helpful. And they've come back to us multiple times saying, you won't believe how we use the model from the competition. It's allowed us, it's like, we've been able to track this one whale that was coming from point A to point Z. So it's really exciting to, to have that happen. Um, similarly, uh, Pet Finder, and I know there's obviously some, some drama on the competition side with Pet Finder, but uh, on the host side, um, I, I truly just enjoyed working with uh, Andy, who's the host over there, that in fact, when uh, I took some personal vacation to Southeast Asia, I uh, took a detour into um, into Malaysia and caught up with Andy. And we went around the markets and maybe tried durian for the first time, and it was not something I enjoyed. Um, I, I think any time that we get the chance to see the very tangible results broadcast in a much in a much bigger way is something that I, I i find very enjoyable and makes it sort of my favorite um the last one i'll mention is uh, nfl you know uh, i'm a big i'm a big sports fan um and seeing that some participants in the nfl at latest competition from the first year um actually made a rule suggestion that was then adopted the next year in the nfl to try to reduce injuries that's a, it's just a great story right it's great to be able to say People looked at data, used machine learning, said, here's what you should do about this. They did it, and it's reducing injuries. So it's just, it's just, it's just kind of good to see that brought into the real world and, um, and, and talked about. Okay. Um, what, what happens after a competition ends? Many, many people, many noobs like me are just there for the bronze medal, barely. <laughs> what happens after the competition ends behind the scenes? Yeah, uh, we, there's a little bit of a joke internally is that we sometimes don't want repeat clients because that means that the competition didn't give them a very valuable result. Uh, now, obviously, we've had multiple competitions with, with, with groups over and over again for, for different problems. But um, we, uh, we sort of take some pride in the fact that the Kaggle competition, thanks to the Kaggle community, can very quickly find the plateau of where the latest and greatest technologies are. Um, we don't do a lot of follow-up with the individual host. Primarily because it's a corporation, um, they now have an ex- a non-exclusive license to the model, and how they implement it is on them. Um, so you know, there's some business elements from how they instituted it. Um, but once the competition concludes, you know, we perform our traditional uh, uh, anti-cheating algorithm to just try to enforce some of the rules on Kaggle. We then let the host review the winning models, make sure that they can produce what they are supposed to produce. Um, Kaggle actually, this may be a surprise. We don't we don't see the winning models. Uh, the okay. winning models are just between the host and participants. Um, it's it's uh, there's some licensing legal stuff behind it, but 
we're kind of just the, the fly in the wall watching all of it happen and, and helping with the transfer. Um, we obviously get to sit in on the, the winner's calls, like Maggie mentioned, and we get to sort of hear them talk about the techniques. We don't actually review the code. That's, that's what the winners do. Um, and then as Maggie mentioned, we host a winner's call. We then talk with the host and say, hey, how was your experience? We'd love to work with you again. Um, and that's really kind of it. Um, and we kind of we kind of leave it at that point, and we uh, try to touch base, see if they want to come back and work with us again. You know, as Maggie's worked with the Data Science Bowl many years in a row, we've had multiple uh, repeat hosts. Um, but from that point on, we just usually see them take um, take the the winning uh, the winning ideas. I, I will say this: what, what I've found more historically is that hosts usually find the most value out of techniques and the discussion forums rather than a very specific algorithm verbatim. Um, so you know, there's been plenty of competitions where maybe one of the most valuable things that they got out of the, the, um, the competition was this one minor technique that was used by a team that came in fifth place to try to create additional data to help with their training, um, they create artificial data. And they would say, hey, this technique alone could save us millions of dollars a year. And, and we're saying, oh, well, that's, that's definitely worth the price of admission for this competition. Um, and and, and a, lot of, a lot of times it's usually the tips and tricks that people are using rather than how did you get that extra point zero 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 one <laughs> accuracy on your model. Um, so it, 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 that's what I think, going back to what Maggie said about the winner's calls, is what is very exciting for us is we see that creativity of the Kaggle community that is um, always kind of eye-opening. Uh, Maggie, you're on mute. <laughs> if I could add to that, a lot of times the benefits to the hosts happen right from the beginning. I mean, Addison mentioned um, an example, and it was um, one of my um, hosts. And um, it was actually the Mercedes competition. And within the first hour or so, because all of their labels were um, anonymized, so you actually didn't know what you were trying to predict. And I think it was Anokis. Um, Anakis put some visualization of the data. And I had a meeting with the host just to check in. And he said, his visualization is something we're actually going to use on the shop floor, because it was such an interesting way to represent the data. And um, that made my day. But it was like, you, sometimes hosts don't have to wait till the end of a competition to see the value. Um, and then the other piece is, I, I remember another host talking about that they had several things in their pipeline to implement. And because they had seen the work of the competitors and the winning solutions and even just things people were sharing, they ha now had evidence to put it in place. You know, because the the community is testing and, you know, you, you get the benefit of all these people trying all these different methods and it points you in the direction of going down paths. So the value to the hosts doesn't just, isn't just isolated to the winning models. It's all the discussions, all of the findings that people are just freely sharing, you know, um, particularly right now I'm, I'm um, working on the Panda competition and I get emails from the hosts all the time. They're like, oh, wow, what's going, you know, oh, they're following the, the discussion boards. They get a lot out of that. So, um, so yeah, I, the, I like that as well. People are learning the whole time. Anuka's Mikhail is, is an 18 year old robot AGI. That, that's an open problem. We're still trying to figure out. I, I mean, the Kaggle community. <laughs> yeah. Phil, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so, you know, coming from where I come from, um, it, not adding too much to what Addison and Maggie said, but, but just, you know, you already, if you're coming to someone with a business problem and data, you probably already have an approach. Um, so the, the real trick is, what am I doing wrong? Or what could I be doing differently? And I mean, just, just witnessing these things um, is really exciting as an ML engineer or an ML researcher because you see that happen like in real time um, where you like we, 
I think I think the Kaggle data scientists often have a pretty good understanding of what a machine learning solution for a particular problem would look like. Um, we would just take the money and run if we were the best. So that's why we give it to the Kagglers because they're way better than us. But um, so you can you can sense you can if you're you can read we check the forums you know every day to try and you know stay on top of issues, make sure that people get responded to. Um, you can see when people bring up these things that are like, that's potentially a game changer, even if it's not just the, the amazing ideas that you see. Uh, and, and it's most clear after a competition is over because people post their solutions and you get to be on winner's calls, but it's, yeah, like Maggie said, during the competition, you're seeing these incredible ideas not necessarily advances, but ideas being applied to this data. It's really, really cool. It's that's a really fun aspect of working on Kaggle competitions. Would you have any? Uh, so the question from the aim is worst experience as a host, but uh, any tough memories from any competitions? Uh, like like Addison mentioned, you're also the first line of defense for the community, and many times uh, if something doesn't happen the way the community expects we are always mad at you for for as the first line of defense but any tough or worst memories from being a competition host yeah, i don't i don't uh, have a specific one uh, I, i'll uh since i'll i'll start off while while phil collects his many 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 thoughts i'm sure <laughs> with that deep sigh um uh I'll, I'll say what can be more frustrating in general, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I can, I can sort of reemphasize it, is um, whenever we're scoping out a competition, we're, we're going to bat both for the host and for the Kaggle community. In other words, there, there are plenty of great problems that may be really interesting from a machine learning perspective that may not be as interesting from a competition perspective or may not be good for the community. And so what can be frustrating are times where, at least for me, in the initial part of the competition scoping phase, which almost never makes it to a competition, is when we say the Kaggle community is going to break this They are go like in a good way. They are going to uh, find the answer to this problem in 24 hours. And it's not a good competition if it's over in a day. Or um, yes, you may have used simulated data, but the Kaggle community is going to reverse engineer your model and and when we can get some when you get some pushback from hosts saying oh no there's no way they can do it and we're trying to go and defend the Kaggle community saying no they will they are very very smart they're smarter than anybody of us on this email thread or on the call that we're having and they and they're still saying no we're pretty sure that this can happen that can be just a poor experience um, for us because we're basically trying to say there's 5 million people out there who are taking a look at your problem and are going to poke as many holes in it as possible. And when some of them do, and then the floodgates open, that's no fun for anybody. Um, you know, we're, we're contrary to popular belief. We don't try to put leakage in the data. And so we, uh, we're, when we detect it or we say, this is how it may work. And a host perhaps pushes back and says, no, we still want to go forward with it anyway it can just be frustrating when they don't, when they don't fully see the value and the strength that Kaggle community brings to the table. Yeah. I, I think um, when um, competitions get off track or when the, maybe the host has expectations that just aren't realistic with our community, like they um, want to confine the group of people who, who access it or, um, their expectations just are out of whack. And then we advise them, as Addison said, I mean, we advise them and say, like, this is what we think is going to work with our community. And then um, sometimes it just doesn't, it doesn't match up. Um, and then we are, we're in the middle. Um, and our goal is to always support the community. But we've got this balancing act, right? Because the host comes in with expectations and the community has their expectations and we're trying to match those up. But that's, uh, that's when they go wrong is when those, the expectations are, are not aligned. Um, that's when it's tough for us. Um, and sometimes we advise them to do stuff and they do it anyway. Um, and then, and then we, yeah, we see the results of that. 
but it that's hard when that happens yeah um Phil, uh, any any comments from you <laughs> um so like maggie said it, it's always hard when you know uh problems come up uh, a mistake was made even you know almost all the time it's uh nothing that anyone would have even thought to be aware of you know very right. inadvertent problem that you know the host who's been looking at this data for years didn't see it we didn't see it um that you know it it feels bad to to let down the community like that um and so that's hard um pro but you know that that stuff happens um you know we we do our best to minimize it um and yeah and we do feel bad when it happens i think probably my worst experience as a host was uh, i ran a competition very early in my tenure at uh at kaggle and uh Partway through, uh, the host um, was using the data for another project. So they, they launched a competition using this data. They used the data for another project. And when they launched that project mid-competition, it released the entire test set to the entire world. Um, <laughs> like the whole idea of the launch of the product was to give the test set to as many people as possible. Um, that was, I think that was about probably a couple months of, of scrambling and fixing and, and doing our best to, to make sure that the community had a workable problem still after, after the test set was revealed, which was really difficult. Um, that was a huge team effort. We all worked on it together to try and find the best way to do it. Um, that, that, that morning, when I when somebody was like, "Hey, they released the thing, and your test set was in it," and I was like, <laughs> "I could I could see I could see my future like laying out before me. <laughs> the horizon was was me in several months being sad. So um, that was probably the worst experience that I had as a competition host." <laughs> But still, on behalf of the community, we're, community, we're grateful for all you do for the community. And uh, many people might not understand. I think most of us do. You, you're only the mediators between us and the real competition host. Th thank you for being that. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. We we try really hard. So thank you. Try. Try. If you were to pick uh, one underutilized um, aspect of competitions from from the community aspect, uh, w is there any first? Or uh, uh, if if you were to pick one, which would, which would that be? Underutilized aspect. I, I think. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh. Underutilized what task or? What was the question? Uh, aspect of Kaggle, broadly speaking, or any competition fr from the community's perspective. Okay. Well, speaking of tasks, Maggie, that's what I was actually going to jump in with. Um, we, we've had a lot of our of potential hosts come in, and they want to ask uh, a much broader question than what serves for a supervised machine learning challenge, um, especially in the current time of the pandemic. Um, a lot of questions around what is the future going to look like um, what can we do about it? And there's a number of competitions that we get that we simply can't host because there is no ground truth. It's predicting some future non-existent data or it's just trying to understand um, understand some, some facet. We've hosted uh, a handful of these as analytics competitions, as you may have seen, where it's more of, it's more of an open-ended question, not fully open-ended, but more of a, a exploratory data analysis. Well, the data sets team um, has created somewhat of a, of a of a, a more formalized approach to this called tasks. So, you know, uh, we ran uh, a, a challenge with the White House. Who, um, gosh, who else was uh, Mark Zuckerberg, or the Zuckerberg Chan Initiative, uh, Allen AI Institute, a wide variety yeah. of, of, of research groups um, around trying to understand uh, COVID, uh, uh, COVID spread and, and a wide variety of issues. We couldn't make that into a Kaggle competition, but we since have this new tasks format that says, here's a data set 
here's some things we want to know about it. Where should we go with it? Um, the difficulty is there's not really a direct link between solve a task, become grandmaster, which is obviously a big element for people, or or yeah. address this problem, write a PhD doctorate paper. But if you're looking to kind of have a little bit more just unique problems that require you to think outside the box, um, that's an area that we're starting to really promote a lot more. And as I'm seeing a lot more of, of interested parties come in and have questions, we are, we're seeing a lot of hosts say, I think this is really going to um, answer the question that we like. Now, the difference is a Kaggle competition, you know, you may have a couple dozen live at any time, and we have 40,000 data sets. It's a little bit more difficult to see what is, um, what's really hot right now, what's, what's trending. But, uh, but we are seeing groups come to us with really interesting problems that uh, are, are trying to address questions that we couldn't otherwise put into a supervised machine learning format. Um, and this is kind of allowing more of a broader approach that I think could help uh, help uh, growing and aspiring data scientists to answer questions in a different format that they may not otherwise be used to. Especially since, uh, as, as we hear, uh, a lot of, of real world, not, not the kind of real world, but a, a rather a lot of industry data science roles that role is is designed to help use data to tell a good story mm -hmm. to uh, to executives or to stakeholders. It's not just here's my model that predicted this the best. That happens a lot, but it may be uh, a data scientist trying to explain to a CIO or or, or, or somebody in a, in, a, in a chief office who doesn't know data science. Here's how the data supports this case, and what we're seeing is the tasks format of of competition or of data, data sets is a pseudo competition format that I think is still pretty underutilized um, uh, just because it, it, it doesn't have the same um, visibility that a competition may by having just a few of them curated on the site. And it doesn't have a very direct, here's your leaderboard score, here's how well you've done. But I think it has a lot of potential for um, data scientists to really learn and expand and kind of play around with new new ideas. I do have to apologize. Uh, I know the competition will be live, but at the time of airing of this interview, but I I actually made a data set around all of the atomic level stats of this podcast and all of the transcripts are up there. And my question to the community would have been, can you find anything interesting out of this? And I didn't even know about tasks at the time. And I had pinged Will who actually pointed me to it. So I, I have to agree with you on that, that it's underutilized, very underutilized. So to all those listening, maybe you want to go and, and submit, a, a, make a submission to the task for this podcast and, <laughs> uh, and see, see how well you do. Luckily, even four grandmasters, Colonel grandmasters have agreed to be on a judge panel and I had no idea how to actually organize it into a competition, even though I have played around with in-class competitions a bit. Um, Phil, Maggie, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, underutilized aspects of Kaggle. Um, I, I would say it's it's less about features on Kaggle and more about um, people tapping the Kaggle community. So people who are really familiar with Kaggle know that you can ask for help and someone will answer your question. Um, people who are comfortable asking to be on a team will do that. I think that there's a lot of people who come to Kaggle and they might be intimidated to ask for help. They might be intimidated to ask to participate on a team. Um, and I think that from what I get to see, our community is actually quite welcoming. They are really smart. And if you look at their resumes, it's very intimidating, but I have not personally had any, um, you know, like even the grandmasters are just so willing to help and, and helpful and and so I think that in some ways, you know, being willing to ask for help is something that's a little bit underutilized. That people should feel comfortable doing that because someone will always be there to help you with some starter code or sharing something. And so I would love to see that happen more. Um, you know, and I think that we have we've acknowledged that maybe there aren't as many women on our platform. And so I would love to see more women kind of stepping in and, and, um, and you know, just being willing to get their feet wet and, and jump in and ask for help and 
form communities and um, and and mentor each other and ask for mentorship. And so I think that while we have a vibrant community, there's there might be a perception that there's like the grandmasters and then everyone else. But I think that anyone can, and you've probably seen this, like anyone can um, make their name and, and find their way. Um, so I'd, I'd love to see more of that. Like, you know, people just taking the steps on Kaggle. Um, Maggie, I know you, you're involved in a few efforts around women in data science. Uh, do you think uh, the reason we don't have a good representation, we have a big gender imbalance on the leaderboards is because of this fake perception that it's, it's an intimidating platform? How, how can we better address this as, as someone who tries to compete actively, somewhat actively on Kaggle? Yeah, so we have done a little bit of research. So uh, we have some uh, people on our team who've actively interviewed um, women and, and other people um, who are new to Kaggle. And th that's some of the things they've said. They're like, oh, I don't want to ask a question. I'm afraid uh, um, that someone is not going to help or that I'm intimidated. And um, and we just, we want to be an environment where anyone, it doesn't matter what country you're from or what uh, what your background is, where anyone can feel comfortable. And the when people do ask for help, you know, and I, you know, we're watching the forums all the time, there's so many people willing to help that I just, um, I would love to see more of that. We are trying to do outreach. So I, I work um, and I meet with the women in data science team to try and promote more, you know, like more ways for them to feel comfortable on our site because they, they would benefit from, you know, participating in the different components of it and building their resume on Kaggle. So it's just, it's, it's something that's like a work in progress, but I'd love to see happen more often. Yeah. I, I think it just originated from, from the part of uh, that, hey, uh, the, a senior data scientist from H2 is competing. Should I compete there? Uh, am I qualified enough to ask that question? Someone from the Rapid AI team is competing. Will I be even able to beat them? And most of the times even we can notice that Kaggle novices are sometimes even in the gold medal zone, someone who hasn't even competed before. Yeah, there's lots of evidence of that. So I, I think it would be great for more people to just, you know, take that first step. Certainly. Yeah, I'll, I'll note a little bit far, a little bit further on that, that probably with the exception of best fitting, who is just, you know, in, in, in their own league, uh, anybody else who, like you said, has H2OAI or the Rapids team, whatever it may be, they all started somewhere. And so you have to start somewhere. You have to ask that initial question. Um, as Maggie mentioned, we really want Kaggle to be a place that you can ask very simple questions, that there really isn't too much of a dumb question, if you will. Um, uh, some of that comes to make sure we have a community that's very healthy with its discourse. Um, but we're really hopeful that, that people can recognize data science didn't exist until 12 years ago, and some people are just starting. At least the yeah. term data science didn't exist until 12 years ago. Everyone's starting somewhere. And, and just because you just because you may not get first place doesn't mean that you still shouldn't enter. Plenty of people are, are coming in uh, the bottom 10% uh, of a competition and still is incredibly valuable and, and a great learning opportunity for them. And so part of my encouragement to those who may be thinking such is kind of don't let your ego get in the way of that. Um, enter into your competitions at first to say, how can I, what can I learn out of this? You can probably come in dead last. I want to make sure I learn something from this competition and then move forward with the idea of trying to learn more and more until all those techniques add up. Um, Dimitri Larko on the podcast recently, he's, he's a senior data scientist. Uh, he's he's uh, the chief data scientist, apologies, at S2. And he mentioned if you haven't won the competition, there's so much to learn because the one who's won the competition has almost to some extent solved the problem. And you you can actually learn a lot if you haven't placed yourself first on the private leaderboard to add to that. That's, yeah, that's yeah. I'll say what, what I find also exciting about it is once the competition concludes and you see everybody sharing their, their feedback, um, two things. One, you often see the higher ranked teams looking at your lower ranked solutions <laughs> and both encouraging the solutions they did and saying, man, I never thought about that technique. That's really cool. Uh, as well as teams saying, you know, if, if for some reason we haven't re-enabled submissions after the competition is concluded, 
saying, hey, can you re-enable these? Because I really want to, I really want to test out this new technique. So that's always really exciting for us to see. I recall a good memory from my first competition, Addison Euro competitions, Grandmaster. But uh, to add to that, I, I performed really badly on my first competition as expected. And I actually shared my memory of my experience of competing on that competition where I just expressed that, hey, I have absolutely no idea what's going on and everyone's just passing me on the leaderboard. And that's where I got my first gold medal in the discussions. So that, that was the best encouragement I've ever received. Right. See, that's great. That's a great example. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Um, also, as, as an extension of Kaggle, there are many events that happen. I have an inside scoop that I was uh, told not to speak of, but will there be more career cons or more events? Uh, career con was an online event, so it's still possible, I guess. But any other events that might be happening anytime soon? Yes, yeah, so, uh, uh, of the inside scoop and information you're not supposed to speak on, I'm not sure what I can or can't speak on either with that. Um, I, I think, you know, we saw such great value with our career cons we've had in the past. Um, we, we had some intentions to host career cons that are more focused in other parts of the world. They may be a little bit more friendly to different time zones, as you know that the previous one was in the U.S. Um, and then, as you may know, we, we host a number of Kaggle days, some in-person meetups uh, with the folks over at Logic AI. Um, in the current climate that we're in, there's a lot of we don't really know what that's going to look like, uh, but we're always looking for opportunities to provide value to the Kaggle community. Um, so we're, um, we're, we're, we're open to open to items. I think at this point, there's still so much, so much uncertainty that we're, um, uh, we're not really sure, honestly. Hope, hopefully some, some interesting events will happen soon though. Mm -hmm. um, so, as a final round of questions, I did some interesting, if I may call it research, and these are personal questions that I found uh, some stories about you all. So I'll start with Phil. Uh, Phil, you're only allowed to play one game for the remaining of your life. Which game would you pick? Only one game. Okay. So the correct answer is the game series that I worked on, uh, Combat Mission. Uh, it has a great replay value. Um, that is the correct answer. Um, my answer, if I'm not allowed to pick something that I worked on, uh, would probably be Mount and Blade. It's a great game. Tons of replay value. Yeah. Okay. Um, Addison, I, I found your very fascinating, very beautiful Instagram. Uh, your, uh, if you were to pick one favorite trail that you walked or any uh, hike that you really enjoyed, single uh, top of your pick, top your favorite single one. Man, yeah, that's that's a that's a hard question. There's a lot of them based on how I'm feeling. Um, I, I did a hike down to Havasupai, which is um, a Native American reservation uh, here in the U.S. near the Grand Canyon. It's permitted. Only a few people can do it per day. It's uh, like a, an 11-mile hike, which I guess is well, about 15, 15 kilometers um, of just complete arid desert. Very, very hot. And at the very, very end, it is a total oasis of the most crystal clear blue water you've ever seen in your life. Beautiful rock formations. Um, that, that was pretty incredible. Awesome. Um, Maggie, I found out you were a SF Giants fan. If, if you were to pick any other team, you're not allowed to mention SF Giants, which one would that be? Um, yeah, so if I were to pick another team, it would be the Thunder, which is my son's um, uh, AAA team. So I have a 10 year old son and he really likes baseball. So um, that's the name of his team. And I would watch that all day. Um, so yeah, I, I like baseball and my daughter and I like to watch him uh, play. And he, he, he's good at hitting, so that's fun. That's but yeah, I, yeah, that's cool. Before we end the call, can you mention, uh, you all are very active on Kaggle forums, but any other social platforms that you'd like to mention for the audience that would like to connect with you? I think we're on all of them. I'm not really on Twitter. I kind of, I kind of, I know that's like blasphemy in this day and age. Um, yeah. I actually saw that like maybe a year and a half after I joined Kaggle that um, Anarchist had started following me. And I said, <laughs> you know, only if, you, only if you care about seeing me tweet about the NBA dunk contest or who's going <laughs> to win the Oscars, there's not really much interesting to follow. Um, but um, I'm on, yeah. LinkedIn and Instagram, but it's pretty much just personal stuff there. 
Okay, I'll I'll yeah. have. Please go ahead. Oh no, I was gonna say it's same for me. I think uh, my content on Twitter is Phil Culleton is my handle. It's probably like ten percent machine learning. 90% politics, I would guess. So I might not be an awesome follow, but I am happy to have everyone. So <laughs> I'll, I'll still have all of your uh, social media profiles linked in the show notes. Please, audience, uh, free, feel free to connect with our awesome guests. Uh, on behalf of the community and personally speaking as well, thank you so much all for joining me on the podcast. And thank you so much for all that you do for Kaggle and for the Kaggle community. This is awesome. Thanks for having Thanks us. For- this is great. Thank you so much. This was really, really great. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give it a review or feel free to shoot me a message. You can find all of the social media links in the description. If you like the show, please subscribe and tune in each week to Chai Time Data Science.